So, good evening, everybody. We are very happy to start this uh, conference, symposium, or we don't really know how to call it, but this sources workshop. Uh, we are very happy that you are all here, and we are very excited about well, what we are going to learn about historical ecology in these days. Uh, I just want you to present you the people here in the table. She, uh, she's Letitia Navarro uh, from the Estación Biológica de Doñana. Uh, we have been uh, working together preparing the, the workshop. Well, I, I'm Miguel Clavero, also from the Estación Biológica de Doñana. Uh, she's Margarita Paneque. She's the delegate of the SIC in Andalusia, and she's hosting us here. So we are very lucky that we have been able to celebrate this workshop in the Casa de la Ciencia, and we are thankful for that. And in the other end of the table, we have Eloy Revilla, who is the director of the Estación Biológica de Doñana. He is being always helpful for all the tasks that we, are, we have been doing. And in, uh, you know, in somewhere online, we have uh, Juanmi González from the uh, LiveWatch Eric infrastructure, where, who have been also uh, working close with us to, to, to get this workshop done. And we are also very thankful for all the, all the work that has been have done everything very easy for, for us. And uh, now I give the work to Margarita. Thanks, Miguel. Well, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Just welcoming you, simply welcoming you to this to this house uh, as the delegate of the Spanish National Research Council. Well, you might know that this is the largest research uh, uh, organization in Spain that is supported by public funds. And this, the Casa de la Ciencia in Seville, is the largest dissemination project of the CSIC in the south of Spain. So we are really happy to host events like this because we can uh, share the the border of the of the research and in this case some also some uh, past uh, investigation that are going to to give us a lot of details and a lot of uh, data about ecology so i'm not going to to say anything else that than i hope you enjoy your stay in these days i hope you you enjoy the the, the building today is very quiet, but tomorrow you will be sharing it with a lot of students from school. So please be patient with them and also be kind with them because they are just learning and starting their, their work and trying to find what they want to be when, when they grow up. So uh, this will be a very busy week here in the building, but that, that is also very nice. You will see how, how nice you see all the corridor full of very, very young people. Uh, I think Miguel's daughter is also coming this week. She's three years old, so she will, she will be around also. So it's, it will be a really nice experience to, to mix the future that is represented by them with the and really knowledge that are gathering all of you. So it's a nice opportunity for us to have everything together here. So uh, be welcome in, in this building in Seville and enjoy the, the meeting. And maybe if we have Juanmi, uh, he wanted to welcome you also, uh, even if he couldn't be here. So, hi, Juanmi. We don't hear, maybe you can do some mimic. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to solve.
me right now? Can you hear me? No. Oh, too bad. Yes. We, we can we hear can, you now. We can hear you. Now? Can you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you so much. No, you know, this is trial and error. As usual. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm an ICT engineer, so someone should destroy us. <laughs> so, bad job. So, first of all, I sincerely apologize not being there today. I would like to be, but tomorrow you will support me there. I'm today in Cadiz, in a magnificent place called... Toruño, Toruño es el Pinar de la Algaida, Pine Tree Forest Algaida, es un Atlantic ecosystem, very beautiful, and for all of you I will tell you something, this is a smell into Phoenician, Greek, Celts, Romans, Almogarabe, Almogarabe, the Arabe. West of the European landscape. Why, why, what you are going to do if I make these days is very important for Laiwa Cherik. Very simple. Without histories, without memory, without the preservation, without having the compilation of our histories, everything is useless. We need to understand what is going on or what is going to happen based on the past. And this past must be based, as in Laiwa Cherik, we used to say, in fair data. Fundable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Yes, you have heard this so many times. But this data, given in the ancient knowledge, is coming from a reliable information. And that's why during these days, based on the anthropogenic and the sociologic and other aspects, you will have the opportunity to enjoy, as Marga said, the magnificent city of Seville. But at the same time, to take into consideration how the importance of ecosystem services from the point of view, of view of the ecosystem services are. For the ecosystem services, from the perspective that from Laiwa Cherik, based on the treatment of those data, on those fair data, how we can support the spatial mapping, the spatial planning, allocation of those distributed resources. Laiwa Cherik has as main aim the federation of distributed resources. Just as the case today, in relation to the history of ecology, ecological history, everything related to the history of the human being and the interaction with the nature, having to account all the peculiar sociocultural aspects. I will tell you something we are very proud uh, about. For instance, like what Eric recently has joined the so-called ICRI, Indigenous Knowledge Research Infrastructure Initiative, funded and supported by United Nations. Why? Because we, even ourselves, here in Europe, we are indigenous of our territory. And the importance of understanding the history of the ecology in the different manifestations, painting, sculpture, music, everything in all the aspects is very important. And taking into account the importance given by the European Union to citizen scientists activities, this is, uh, this is uh, more than clear. But having said this, how can we support you? In fact, tomorrow in our presentation, that uh, thanks so much, Miguel, was last time title, including in the agenda, how we can support you. We can support you by collecting, supporting you to federate and create a knowledge base, if possible, permanent. And you know that in this life, there is nothing anything that is permanent for all life. How to federate all of, the, of them and take into account if you are a researcher, a decision maker, an entrepreneur, a citizen, how we can show you in a simple way the accessibility to provide access in a fair way to those resources. Because it is very important in Europe and worldwide, now more than ever, in a climate change scenario, to guarantee the transgenerational knowledge from the senior people to the children, top down and bottom up. That is essential. And the role of these days, you there in Seville, online, hello to all the people connected online, by the way, as well, is essential to understand where we are and where we're going to. And to understand where I'm going to from the human point of view, because we are apes, we are mammals, we need to understand the history and the different cultural manifestations take into account something so essential such as its nature, such as its ecology, because ecology is everything. And many, uh, many times people are forgetting about that. And the only way to convince the people that we need to act right here, right now, for preservation, for instance, of our magnificent landscapes, 
is to provide an open source system to federate all of them and show, take into account the best of the positioning, geography information system, spatial planning, etc. And based on the paradigm of ecosystem services, more in particular, cultural ecosystem services, the so-called CES, you are the real experts, how we can tokenize, how we can provide socioeconomic value to the activity we are doing. So that is important to recognize and respect the hard activity you are doing in order to support, to preserve the heritage. Having said that, I'm finishing for like what can be of our family. We consider your part two as well and looking many faces there, family faces as well. We remain at your disposal and tomorrow maybe there will be more plenty of time to discuss our presentation before, during, on then, after, how we can contribute and, fo and foster that collaboration. And I would like to congratulate the CSIC as well for their excellent work through the Sunhal project funded by Laiwa Cherik to the Ministry of Science and Innovation, as well as Miguel Clavero, because Miguel Clavero now there in uh, so humble he is, is an uh, outstanding person who's going to say many things in collaboration with all of you in relation to the how to defend all this preser preservation of natural heritage. And Leticia, I think Leticia is also there. And because I look at you, I'm watching you in very snow, uh, small. Marga, ah, Eloy, hello, Eloy. Hola, Eloy. It's you, no? Yes, it's you. Hello, my friend. So, yeah, and many people that I cannot see because I look at you in a very small time, uh, many place. So, and the idea as well is how we can protect landscapes. This is a simple issue, landscapes. I know into the point of Doniana, for instance, but yes, Eloy, Marga, Leticia, Miguel, landscapes. Okay, you understand why? Based on fair data, fair, based on the ES science, based on the heritage, on the preservation, and how to preserve that glorious treasure of knowledge of ecological history. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to meeting all of you tomorrow and try to enjoy today as much as you can, because I don't know there. I think it's sunny, like here in Cadiz uh, as well. And it was a very ma ma marathon day here today, but very profitable from the Harvard University of Cadiz. And uh, we went looking in facilities on Algae, Algae for sequest carbon sequestration, uh, everything related to pine tree forests, and very transdisciplinary, as I like what it is, always based on fair data. Uh, it is curious. I didn't need any PowerPoint today. So this is demonstrating that there is life beyond PowerPointing. Haha. <laughs> so, my friends, with the same enthusiasm as usual, because enthusiasm is for free, and we need that. Thanks so much. Over to you. Merci beaucoup. Danke, uh, danke well. Danke schön. Tak. Gracias mille. Muy obrigado. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Juanmi. Eh, te veremos mañana por aquí. Oh, <laughs> eh, for any, any of the languages that they're attending, because I went to the program of the people, the speakers and the people attending, and I, thought, I think I, I said thank you in all the uh, languages. Well, I forgot the Scarry as well. Okay, Scarry Casco. Muchas gracias. Okay, th thank you very much, Juanmi. And, okay. and, and now we're going to have the, the words by Eloy Revilla, our director at EBD. Thank you, Margarita, th for hosting this, this meeting here. Thank you, Miguel and Leticia, and, and thank you also, Juanmi, for, for supporting this uh, large project, uh, Sumhal project, which is the one actually feeding all this, all this research that has been done in relation with historical ecology in, this, in these years. I will be very brief. I'm in charge of a research institution that, you, that most of you know is, a, is a, an institute belonging to the Spanish Council for Research, the Estación Biológica de Doñana, Spanish Council for Research. We work mostly on ecology, evolution, and the conservation of biodiversity. We also have a, a large-scale uh, infrastructure in Doñana within the National Park where lots of research is done, not only by us, by many other people, and you are invited to, to work there. We have facilities there that you can use, uh, mostly for free and it's a, a very good place to work in, in any topic related with uh, global change. Why? Because global change is, is on our face in there. It's, uh, we are seeing changes very fast, uh, and it's one of the hot uh, spots in the world, I would say, for research relating to, to changes in, in biodiversity in, in, in life, uh, real time. What can I say about uh, this, this uh, workshop? 
uh, you are very welcome to Seville, to our institution, not only here. We, we formerly were here in this building. It's a beautiful uh, place, uh, this, this location. You are right in the center of Sevilla. Sevilla is a, a, a very, uh, uh, not only warm, also, uh, also, is w also warming for the people. Uh, it's very welcoming. Uh, it's a nice place to visit. You have lots of places related with his history here, uh, also the Archivo de Indias, uh, where lots of files are collected with the, uh, documenting the relation with Americas, with the Americas, uh, and, and it's, it's a very good source of information. And then the, the work that Miguel and, and Leticia and, and, and their team has been doing uh, these years is, is has just produced a, a wealth of data that will be very useful in the, in the years to come and will produce lots of uh, uh, good science and, and lots of, uh, I would say, reference points for conservation in the future, and that's very important. So welcome uh, you all, and, and that's it. Thank you, Eloy. So I'll be closing this welcoming session and being brief as well, but I uh, wanted to, to thank you all for coming, to welcome you here on behalf of, Mig of Miguel and myself and tell you a little bit why, why we're here today. And the starting point of this is something that you're probably already very much aware of, but it's the fact that um, long-term biodiversity data is needed for good ecological knowledge and for biodiversity conservation. But in practice, the reality is that, the, for instance, to measure the status and, tr and trends of biodiversity, we tend to use relatively uh, short time series. And that doesn't mean that historical data uh, is not out there, but the reality is that this data is often scarce and is often hidden uh, in material that we as conservation biologists are not so used to work with. And so Miguel and I, we wanted to, to fix that, and that's why we organized this meeting, and that's why we brought uh, a lot of uh, experts here that and we're gonna hear about their work over the next couple of days. Um, and the idea is that we want to, to, to learn and discuss how uh, we can identify historical data hidden in uh, historical material, how we can mine this information, how we can integrate it and use it uh, for research in, uh, in biodiversity. So without further ado, and unless you want to add something to this introduction, I think we can start. Yes the keynote sessions, and I'll let you introduce our first keynote speaker. Okay, so for starting the workshop, we will have here Peter Savo. It is a great pleasure to have Peter in here. Uh, when, since I started doing things like historical ecology, Peter was a figure for me, so I, 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 we are really honored to have him. And uh, Peter is originally, by formation, I think I'm a medievalist, I would say, a, a, hist a historian, so he comes from the other side of that, pr probably the rest of us are something like environmental scientists in some way, or natural sciences. Uh, researchers and Peter Hunt come from history and he has been doing some really nice uh, really interesting works on on forestry and on uh, historical forestry and and integrated and in a in a botany institute in the Czech Republic and uh, he led a wonderful project uh, funded by ERC project uh, mobilizing a huge amount of documents and he has always had this sense of the, uh, the, the usefulness of historical ecology approaches for biodiversity conservation that I have, you know, have been, for me, have been inspired all, all inspiring all the time. So uh, we, for sure, we will enjoy a lot his uh, talk here. So Peter, if you want. It's such an honor to be here, such a pleasure. Uh, this is a wonderful place. I wish my children could come as well, but I'm afraid that's not going to happen. Um, before I start, I have a personal confession to make. First, it's been a long day, so I don't think I'll be able to meet Juan Miguel's level of intensity, but I'll, I'll try. Uh, and the second one is when I... Isn't the sound awful, or is it just me? It's a little too... What should I do with this? Oh no. How about now? A little bit better? No, now you don't hear it. Oh, it's this one. It should, yes. Yeah, I think it's. 
Now there's nothing? OK. <laughs> I think this one's going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but now you could, now, I, now you don't hear me. No. <laughs> okay. okay. We will hear you from there. What if we try like this? Oh no, it stopped work. No. I. Oh, but it's the same. Ah, sorry. Now, eh, okay. Better? Not really. Never mind. Okay, maybe. Okay, I'll try not to shout. Okay, so the other personal confession I have to make is that when I, uh, I was thinking what to do here, yes, and I thought, you know, I could do the over all the great research that's going on, but I thought that's maybe not because you will hear a lot of that in the next two days. And uh, also, as far as I understand, the next presentation is going to do something like that, so maybe we'll complement each other rather than anything else. Um, then, no, this is really not working. Maybe it's that one? Maybe. Ah, it's okay. Okay. How about this one? No? This works. Okay. Yes, but this one? Okay. 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 Yes. 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 It's on? No, no, now it's on. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now I'm trying to speak. Microphone check. One, two, three. No. Okay? okay? Yes. Thank you. You can tell I'm not a rock star immediately. Um, fa I don't think it improved much. Okay, I'm going to keep talking and maybe. Okay, where was I? I'm sorry. Where was I? So I was thinking what to do. I, I sort of realized.
phase. So first one, as a natural historian, as, as, as a natural scientist, yeah? First one is access, okay? It's not at all trivial to find sources that you want, okay? Uh, this is just a website from where I work. It's very, it can get very complicated. It's, I can compare this to, for, 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 for a botanist, for an ecologist, going to a completely new island. First, you have to find your way around, yeah? It's a little bit like that. You also avoid something if you, if you manage your identifying your sources properly, you avoid overexcitement. I've seen this many times in my life. People find the source and say, oh, this is so special. Now, if you know the context, say, oh, I'm sorry, this is really, it, it's completely not special. It doesn't mean anything, okay? Uh, so you have to get used to, to the sort of source situation that you have in a, in a, in a particular place. And then you have to, and that's for, uh, like for a natural scientist, this is the next stage. You have to be able to, identify sort of get physically access physical access to your to your source so in this case it means you have to be able to read it which means you need language skills and you need paleographical skills those skills just like sort of taxonomy skills i think in the world are rapidly disappearing it's really difficult to find a specialist it's just for your enjoyment this is the kind of stuff you face sometimes okay don't underestimate the difficulty the next thing you have you come across is taxonomy. Because sometimes they talk about something and they obviously mean something, but you have no idea what they're talking about. This is just an example. 1600, okay? This is based in Czech. It's, it, they're talking about oaks. And they say that there are three types of oaks. One is called Quercus. The other one is called um, Robur. And the third one is called uh, somewhere Ilex. Oh, there, Ilex, okay? Now, if you know the Czech Republic a little bit, this makes no sense, absolutely. I have no idea what they're talking. They're talking about oak, but I, other than that, I don't understand. There's certainly no, no ilex where I, where I live. But this is not just, you know, this is actually traditional ecological knowledge because here it says we asked the old people and they told us these are the three types, these are the characteristics of the three types. I still have no idea what they're talking about, okay? Uh, so you have to figure these things out. Uh, third problem or challenge is spatial precision. Okay, if you find something, you have to know where it is. If you don't know, don't really know where it is, it's not quite as useful. Uh, and this can. This, there, there are two extremes. Okay, one extreme is this. These are the famous witness trees uh, of North America, where when they were going to settle the lands, they sent out engineers and they measuring and what they were doing here as you can see there are maps and there's a, there's a mark point here and then I don't know the distances between the different trees and the trees are really nicely identifiable taxonomy is not really a problem so you know actually you get nice little notes here so you know if you give it you know enough work you can tell exactly well relatively precisely where this particular tree was okay that's good okay uh, but it's not always possible. Here's something for me. That's 17th century. That's an estate inventory. And that's a tree there. Lehrbaum. That's, uh, that's a large tree. That's Larix decidua, which is very interesting. There are only four population, four kind of, well, it grows in four places in Europe. And the smallest one Republic, and we're sort of trying to figure out whether it was there all the time, whether it's indigenous. We wrote a paper about this, but this is an estate inventory. It's very, it's very significant that in the mid, in the late 17th century, there's a large tree there. As for spatial precision, I can identify this within, with the spatial precision of 500 square kilometers. Okay, not so good. Okay, what to do with this? Uh, Next challenge is reliability, okay? When they say, when you figured out, you know, taxonomy, let's say, um, when they say it's that kind of fish or this kind of fish, is it actually, do they, did they know what they were talking about? Is it really, and sometimes it's great. This is a very famous fishery ordinance from the very early 16th century by uh, Emperor Maximilian. Uh, and there you can, it's perfect, I think, for you fish people. Uh, so you can really know what they were talking about. If you're interested in this, by the way, finally, 
uh, the book called The Catch about medieval fishing, written by Richard Hoffman, who's a great environmental historian from York in Canada, finally is coming out. So if you're interested in the analysis of this particular document, you should go to that book, okay? But it's almost never this nice, yeah? So at the end of the day, you just have to ask yourself a question like this, something they asked last year in bioscience, was Henry David Thoreau a good naturalist or not, you know? Do we believe him when he says this or that? So they, just, they wrote the paper about this. Uh, the answer is yes. The last question, in some sense, is the, is the most difficult, and it has to also to do with uh, reliability, of course, is purpose. That's what my natural scientist, ecologist colleagues forget the most often. Every, nothing, nothing, nothing you find in historical sources was ever created to help you, okay? And it's a huge difference. If you look at biology data, as it were, it was created to be the kind of data that you want. In history, it's never like that, never, okay? So you always have to keep in mind, somewhere at the back of your mind, why were they doing this, okay? So this is just a map with the paper down there, how reliable is my historical land use? So I said it has to do with reliability. Well, it's a land use map, yeah? You can see that uh, this is a meadow, this is pasture, these are, these are forests and various kinds of meadows and all Sorry. that. Oh, my batteries are off. Okay. okay I'll, I hate microphones. Uh, no problem. So what you can see, it looks like a, a land use map, yes? But it's, it, it's a land use, it's a byproduct, basically. This is a taxation map that is based on land use. And there's a big difference. Uh, a, because of course, it doesn't, it, it, this place didn't really look like this. This, was, this place was translated into this form, you know, uh, something that James Scott called making the landscape legible. So whatever they saw, they, they put them into these seven categories, okay? But that's not the only problem or challenge. The other thing is, uh, so it's, it's not only that, you know, it's maybe it was a little bit more complicated. We're still doing it today, yeah? Every cadastral map, even today, is a simplification of the landscape. But it's more complicated than that. Actually, the boundaries between these things are dependent on the owner, yeah? This is what this paper is about. It says, if two pieces of land belong to the same owner, basically, then the boundary is much less precise, most probably, yeah? It's because it was made for taxation, and this person was actually saying, oh, this is my land, this is my land, that's where the boundary is, yeah, okay. You see, and he sort of bent reality the way he or she wanted it, okay? So you always have to keep purpose in mind. And if you get all these things, and I shuffled them up a little bit so that I can make this joke, if you have all your parts together, uh, then you can go and interpret your sources, you can do something with them, okay? And interpretation matters, and I'm paying tribute to Miguel, new, new work. This is, this is how interpret, you're going to hear about this tomorrow, but I'm just very briefly. This is why interpretation matters. These are two papers based on the very same source, 19th century Hughes geographical lexicon. And this one, it's wolf distribution in Spain. This one, as you can read it here, long sentence, took all the mentions of the wolf, uh, and said this was the distribution of the wolf in 19th century. Miguel and colleagues said it's a little bit more complicated because, once again, this source was not made to be helpful to you, okay? Sometimes they mentioned the wolf, sometimes they didn't mention the wolf. Is there sort of a, 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 a is there some sort of an order, or, or you, you know, some sense when they mentioned it, when they didn't mention it? You can work with this a little bit better. Uh, at some places, they just didn't mention any, any animals at all because they didn't. Other places, they mentioned some animals, didn't mention the wolf. From this, they created pseudo absences and modeled the rest. And so what you see here, this is what I'm saying, the interpretation matters. That's a very, very different picture, okay? So simply by interpreting your source, you get from this to that, okay? Big, big difference. Also, of course, it has lots of policy implications and all that. Okay, so here it was sort of a lack of 
sophistication, let's say. Um, another case, you can see here, is the catch of northern cod of eastern Canada. First paper says everything was relatively fine. Oh, MSY is maximum sustainable yield. So this paper says up until the late 20th century, everything was kind of okay. Yeah? So they were fishing, but it was not so bad. You know? and in the old days, they didn't. Okay? Up comes another paper by Paul Holmes, former president of the European Society of Environmental History, and he says, you forgot about a lot of sources, okay? Here, there's no lack of sophistication. This is ni it's a nice model, nicely done, everything. He says, you just didn't use half of the sources and you didn't understand the other half, okay? And that's, that's the result they came up with. Uh, he said, already in the, I mean, already, let's say, in the, in, the, in the 16th century, the catch was twice as bad or twice as much as the first paper says. But crucially here is the mid-18th century when it goes over the sustainable level, okay? There's a big difference, once again, okay? You can no longer say traditional was good or I don't know, he said, this was already in the 18th century heavily overfished, okay? So interpretation of your sources matters. And now with this we come to quantification. And this is the issue, it's the million dollar question. This is what I hear from my eco ecologist colleagues the most often, because you see, historians, they deal in stories. Yeah? They deal in narratives, okay? But when I say, oh, there was this forest, and then they always say, yeah, okay, okay, give me more, okay? Just, I want, you know, I, I don't want two, I, I want 200. So how to do, this is what I call quantification. And it's a very vague term, as you will understand. But uh, this is what's most needed by ecologists, that's my experience, and most feared by historians. Historians don't really like numbers. Not all of them, of course, and I apologize to all the economic historians sitting in the room. Uh, but this, you know, historians don't deal in large numbers, okay? When they do, it's just illustration. Oh, they used a lot of resources, for example, I don't know, 20,000 tons of stones. It's like, well, what's that? Anyway, uh, so you have two options if you want to quantify, you know, uh, historical sources. A, you find the source with universal coverage. That's, that's the Wolf paper that, that I talked about. Or you try to extract the same information from diverse sources of limited coverage, okay? And you win and you lose. In the first case, you increase spatial coverage, of course. You get the whole of Spain, more or less. You decrease diachronicity. Basically, it's, it, it's a history, it's out of time, basically. It's just a snapshot. You, ne you can never tell if this was typical 50 years before, 50 years after. It's just a snapshot, okay? And of course, if your source is biased, you exaggerate that bias, you know. You just project it over the entire country. In the second case, you increase diachronicity. You get sort of, you know, you get temporal layers, hopefully. At the same time, you decrease compatibility. You, can, you never know, actually, if they're talking these sources because they're not the same. They're talking about the same thing. And you might hope that the biases sort of cross each other out, but in my experience, they're actually cumulative. You get more and more biases of different types and you just get, end up with worse and worse data. So, how do you do this? For example, look at this paper uh, of the witness trees in North America. And it is for this particular paper, uh, Cogbill and colleagues, they counted Remember those individual trees there. These are, this is more than 100,000 they counted, okay? They put it on the map, and it looks wonderful, yeah? If you look closer at the data, you see it's actually pseudo-synchronic, because this is not a snapshot. This is at least 100 or maybe even 200 years, okay, of continuous data. In that sense, it's ahistoric, because, or better said, it's a historical nar narrative turned into ecological baseline, because look at the title of the paper, Forest of pre-settlement New England. They just said there are forests pre-settlement and post-settlement. And that is, that's a historical narrative, okay? Very many historians are un unhappy with this because they don't believe, especially in North America, that the pre-settlement age was sort of static or, you know, all nice to the environment. But this is it, okay? So this is where you turn a historical narrative into an ecological baseline. It's a great paper. I'm not criticizing it. Another way to, to try to sort of quantify this, 
as my colleague Tomáš Samoelik from Poland says, quantifying historical human impact. What he did here, this is the last primeval forest in lowland Europe called Białowieża. I apologize for my Polish pronunciation. Um, and what he did here is he had a look at a lot of written sources, but also archaeology, landscape archaeology, and sort of tried to uh, quantify in some senses, of course, uh, human impact on the forest. Uh, and therefore, uh, after this, he turned that into estimated naturalness. Okay? And as you can see, quantifying is not, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a vague term because all natural sciences will know this is not quantitative data. This is, quali this is ordinal data. It's qualitative. But never mind. What he was trying to do is sort of gather enough information to, 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 to call this quantification. Okay. And now a little bit at the end about my work. We, this, in, this, in this ERC project that Miguel was talking about, we decided to take a look at forests, okay? In uh, this region where I live, which is about 27,000 square kilometers, okay? There's lots of, lots of, lots, lots of data <laughs> available. But we had a problem, of course, with the, not with the taxonomy, trees are very simple there, uh, but compatibility, basically. How to gather all this kind of data into a database that has some sort of a basic structure uh, where you can identify certain things. And how can we spatially sort of uh, put this on the map? So this is the result or one entry in the database that you can see on the left side. This is for the historians. This is the metadata you need if you do historical research. If you take it seriously, so where is it? What's the source? When it was published? Who recorded it? And so on and so on. And there on the right side, you see the, the data on the forest. And we just said, OK, because it's so diverse, the data, OK? We can only focus on a few things. So what we focused on was, yeah, so these are the Czech terms, tree species, OK? Then uh, the area of the forest management of the forest uh, and other sort of human activities that were going on in the forest. And I said, this is something that, can, that is mentioned all over the place. And if we bring all these things together, maybe something will come out of it. As a result, I mean, the numbers, the numbers so now we have in the database 50,000 pieces of information on, on individual forests and 465 different sources ranging from the 11th to the 20th century is the data we have, okay? And now you can do stuff with it if you're interested. It's a combination of some of these, some of these sources cover large areas. Some of them are snapshot data, some of them are diachronic data. You can start playing with it. So you may want to look at uh, silver fir, obvious alba, which is like the biggest mystery tree in the region because from, it went from this in the 19th century to basically zero by now, and it, it's, it is a mystery. So you can take a look at the distribution in late uh, 18th century, mid 19th century, early of course, then you can speculate, okay, why is this, was this actually expanding? Then you realize no, because that's a relatively complete source. That's, those are, that's like, I don't know, 300 individual sources completely not complete and so on. We're just working on interpreting this, so I can't tell you how it worked out. You can do something else. Uh, this is now Middle Ages, where we think we found the words for a particular type of forest management. These are all the mentions. For this, we went through something like 7,000 individual medieval documents looking for this word. This is the map. Once it's, in, it's incomplete, so we looked for a model that worked with presence-only data. That's, you know, that's the big challenge, absence, pseudo-absence presence in these sources. And so we used certain parameters and we modeled uh, the probable distribution of this type of woodland management. And when this was done, I could happily turn myself back into a historian and then interpret sort of this distribution uh, in light of numbers of people and their firewood consumption uh, in the late Middle Ages. And it sort of worked out happily. Uh, okay. And the last thing, I think, it's the last slide I have. Uh, with a colleague of mine, a young colleague, that's him, <laughs> raking the forest, for example, took mentions of litter raking, there's all these yellow dots there, uh, in the forest, and he was interested in 
uh, finding out whether this literally raking, really raking the leaves of the forest, uh, of, of, of the trees out of the forest. It was very widespread in the 19th century, as you can see, and he was interested in the legacy of this particular forest management. Whether you can see any difference, and those are, those are the graphs, whether you can see any difference in, the, in today's vegetation that may stem uh, from this by now abandoned forest management. There were some differences, but very slight, of course, as it happens. Okay, so I think with this, I will finish. Uh, and what, is, uh, what, what I wanted to say really is that there's tremendous amounts of data. That's my long-term experience. Not always for what you want, okay? But if you sort of, if your interests are broad enough, there is for our purposes in European and other archives as well, there's unlimited amounts of data, really. For human purposes, it's unlimited. There are millions and millions of pages of documents containing valuable data. But we're, uh, this, this one, for example, is it's from the late, it's from the mid-15th century. It's just a list of the trees they were cutting in a particular forest. They said, we cut one oak, one lime, and so on. It goes on and on and on, hundreds of trees, okay? And there's lots of, lots of data like this. But uh, uh, I think, even though you've all done great work, uh, in the past 20 years, and, you know, gathering and trying to interpret it. I think generally we're really at the beginning. Uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. So what we've been thinking Miguel is that we were going to have the two keynote presentation back to back and then we'll have a, a joint uh, discussion with our two speakers. So I will then introduce our next speaker, Chelsea. And I have to apologize to you because I won't be able to do such a detailed introduction as uh, Miguel did for Peter, but what I can tell you is for, uh, for this symposium and And we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, check, check. All right. So I'm going to talk about the historical ecology of cultural landscapes. And I'm gonna do this from an archeological perspective. So between Peter and I, you'll have a nice uh, dose of social sciences tonight. Um, although I don't think we always identify as just that. Um, and Unfortunately, fortunately, we're gonna hang out in the temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest for most of the talk, but I think there's gonna be a lot of kind of broad applications that can be made uh, to other regions as well. For decades now, researchers have studied and abstracted and tinkered with this idea of the cultural landscape. These are spatial units that encompass the broadest range of a society's land use behaviors, 
as well as the history of people interacting with the natural world. In settler nations like Canada, America, Australia, cultural landscapes include very vast and interconnected networks of indigenous people's homelands, trails and roads, tended and managed forests, cultivated shores, cultivated intertidal shorelines, as well as the more than material infrastructures that constitute placemaking. So this includes things like governance structures, uh, ownership, land-based laws, and genealogies. These are all part of a cultural landscape. As practitioners of historical ecology, uh, I like that Peter talked about the kind of the, the two tastes of historical ecology. Of course, I'm going to be talking from the kind of Bill Belay, Carol Crumley School, which stems from archaeology and anthropology. And in that context, historical ecologists have really come to um, appreciate that or have even internalized the idea that ancient and ongoing indigenous land use and management has transformed all ecosystems on Earth. And this is one of Bill Belay's core, four core postulates of historical ecology, right? There's not an ecosystem left on Earth that's been untouched in some form by humans. But not only that, in very recent years, researchers have come to recognize what indigenous peoples have always known, that many of those same land use and management practices have a disproportionately greater role in maintaining and stewarding some of the most biologically and functionally diverse ecosystems on Earth. So the IPCC now recognizes a large and growing body of scientific literature, in fact, probably just within the last five years or so, uh, which demonstrates the critical role of many indigenous communities as guardians of the world's lands and forests. And it, there's um, a counterpoint to this too that I'll talk about, but basically what we're seeing in a lot of this literature is lower rates of deforestation, lower carbon emissions, higher carbon storage, more equitable and sustainable forest restoration efforts, and basically just more benefits for more people. Generally, we see better environmental, economic, uh, and social outcomes on indigenous-owned lands versus public or private entities, including protected areas. This growing realization is in step with what we call the decolonial turn or decolonial thinking, which has certainly existed since the very inception of modern forms of, of colonialism, right, starting in the 1500s and 1600s. But there has been a very profound shift in the 60s and 70s, right? There's a, um, almost a growing disillusion with modernization and technocracy, which is still unfolding now, so it's an unfinished project, this decolonial turn. And we can think of it as a bit of a counterpoint to the accelerated rhythm of, of capitalist exploitation of labor and land, of colonial exploitation of labor and land. And again, it's clear that this project will remain uh, unfinished for some time because despite the growing awareness among researchers, uh, even in popular science, increasingly about indigenous peoples, homelands, um, these are still virulently contested spaces, and we still have a lot of work that needs to be done. Colonization and coloniality still persist in all facets of archaeology, historical ecology, and just academia in general. In the Pacific Northwest of North America, despite decades and decades of research on the topic, the notion of indigenous people's homelands as culturally mediated and managed spaces is still challenged. It's challenged in Canadian courts, it's challenged in public policy, in environmental regulations. I don't know if there's any anthropologists in the room, but if you, if you don't have experience with this, that's okay. All I'll say is that in the Early 1900s, the Pacific Northwest was kind of like the rock star hangout for anthropologists. People from all over the world came to study societies in the Pacific Northwest because they were so perplexed by the fact that there were complex, stratified societies with monumental architecture and public works, but all without agriculture and all without extensive land use. So this perplexed anthropologists, right? Because it kind of confounds the, the typical pathway of cultural evolution. 
Now, early settlers, we see in historical texts often using these ideas or, or writing these ideas down like there was no agriculture and like look at these large longhouses and, and there was slave systems and hierarchy but no agriculture, no agriculture. And certainly some historians have pointed to the fact that early settlers had very good reason to ignore people's land use history, right? That was part of settlement narratives. But what we see is that successive generations of researchers, knowingly or not, further contributed to that erasure uh, of the cultural landscape, either by downplaying or ignoring people's uh, land use and management practices. But we started to, we know now from mostly piecemeal ethnographies, right, the, the written record in places like Canada and the US is very short, and so ethnographies are one of the main texts that we use to source historical data and going back even further depending on the type of research that was done. But we know from these ethnographies and more importantly from a lot of indigenous scholars and indigenous communities who have been saying for a long time, you know, people have been actively constructing, managing and engineering local environments. Despite there being no agriculture, right, people were burning, people were tilling, people were pruning, coppicing seed broadcasting, transplanting, mulching, fertilizing, weeding, and even irrigating. And this resulted in supposedly wild ecosystems, still termed wild ecosystems today. Places like managed berry groves, Gary Oak ecosystems, Camas prairies, and more recently forest gardens, which I'll talk about. As a result of some of these themes, you know, archeologists and anthropologists working in settler nations are deeply implicated in the discourses of land use and colonialism. So this is a huge, huge topic in historical ecology in places like Canada. And people are implicated in this, this uh, discourse whether they want to be or not. And as a research program, we face a few challenges then. And so one of the most obvious challenge, like Peter talked about a bit, most obviously we draw on very powerful explanatory data sets. Um, but these are materialist viewpoints, right? Not to be confused with cultural materialism for any anthropologists in the crowd, but it's a trace-centric science. We're piecing together very disparate, very incomplete, and even ephemeral narratives, right? The ethnographies and the historical texts are great, but how do we investigate and document the material signatures of leg and legacies on the land, especially if those practices like we see in the Pacific Northwest, were meant to just enhance or mimic natural processes. And Kawika Winter, an ecologist from Hawaii, calls this eco-mimicry on the island, right? It's not this net turnover in species that you can easily identify. And again, as we go further and further back through time, those traces get scanter and scanter. Another challenge is that as historical ecologists, again, coming from the Bill Belay, Carol Crumley school of thought, is that we focus on the interpretation of culture and environment, not on human adaptation to environment. And there's a real succinct difference here because focusing on something like culture and not merely adaptation to environment, um, this is very regionally specific, this is obviously very culturally specific, and so these are um, data that are drawn from areas that can't be you know, scaled up or modeled very easily. And as we become more in step with the decolonial turn, these are fundamentally anti-colonial positionalities which can become politicized um, and, and certainly framed in identity politics which tends to question scientific rigor. So considering all this with the rest of the time we have, I'm going to highlight just some of the ways in which my colleagues and I have worked to first develop some of those succinct methodologies and practices that combine archaeological, ecological, linguistic, adauch, and other empirical data, and which ultimately, not on purpose, but as a result, tend to counter, challenge colonial narratives and perspectives about people and land. Okay. Like I mentioned, land use legacies can be challenging to document. Right? Again, if those practices aren't resulting in, in large-scale shifts 
in you know, the domestication of a plant species or if you're not getting a huge kind of imprint on the landscape. Uh, so it can be hard to spot. And one of the approaches used, of course, is to start by looking at a contemporary landscape and asking, how did it get this way? Um, and Peter, I don't know if you remember this, but a few years ago, we were emailing about a paper and we were talking about these two things. And one of my favorite things that you say, and I still use to this day, is that we look at cultural patterns and biophysical processes where neither is the protagonist. And I think this is really important because in context, Canadian context, American context, I tend to see, you know, folks in anthropology and archaeology really overemphasizing human impacts and, and, and human roles in ecosystem change. And then the reverse, of course, where ecologists are, tend to ignore or downplay people. And so really it's, it's, it's scrutinizing these two things on a kind of equal playing field that becomes really important. So to document historical and ancient management in the Pacific Northwest, some of the things that we've started to look for are some of these patterns, plants associated with archeological sites. Good start, lots of folks do that. Plants growing outside their natural range or natural habitat. Plant assemblies that are more rich or more diverse and plant assemblies that are ethnobotanically significant. Focusing on plants outside their natural range or natural habitat, we can start to key in on practices like transplanting and translocations. While some plant ranges in the Americas appear to be wild, wild, loaded term, they are in fact the result of ancient plant movements, of people moving favorable species throughout their homelands throughout time. Again, not resulting in those large scale genetic shifts like you would see in the isolation and domestication of uh, cultivars. So we outline this kind of multi-method approach that uses ethnographic, ecological and archaeological data and we, we've been able to show how to at least start thinking about documenting ancient plant movements. Again, in the Pacific Northwest, but this sort of thing could really lend itself to uh, other regions as well, especially temperate regions. So we compiled these lines of evidence kind of spanning these different spatial and temporal ranges, um, looking at things like linguistic evidence, looking at oral histories, phytogeographic indices, and we concluded that where a species, or species was referenced in, in three or more of these categories or lines of evidence, it was probably a good candidate to start looking at human-assisted movement. So some of the species included Almelanchir, Alnifolia, Comicia kamash, Nicotiana, and I'll give you an example specifically with hazelnut. So this is the um, contemporary distribution of hazelnut in British Columbia on the northwest coast. And what we have is a um, California variety. These used to be two different species. They're now different varieties. Um, and so this California variety in the south there, that obviously goes all the way down to California. And then on the western slope of the Rockies is this interior hazelnut. And then in the north, there's what uh, ecologists have called a disjunct or isolated population. And the narrative is that, you know, it was probably part of a previously larger distribution from the population in the north and that it was cut off by a geological event like a glacier. Morphologically, however, it doesn't seem to really add up. The involucry on the hazelnut is, is much more similar to what we see in the south and the, um, the, the nut itself typically grows in, in four to five nuts per cluster rather than the one to two. And so this became kind of an interesting thing for us to explore. Looking at the paleobiolinguistics becomes really interesting too. So this northern region is known as Gixan and Simshan territory, and their word for hazelnut is skan tsech. Skan referring to any woody shrub, and tsech referring specifically to the nut. Very, very similar to the Proto Salish and Squamish word for hazelnut, tsech. Now, there are 11 indigenous language families in Canada, nine of them are in BC. This is a very, very linguistically diverse region, and these are entirely different language families. So it's impossible that these are cognates, and it's very likely that it was a loan word, and we think a loan nut. 
This compelled us to uh, further investigate the distribution, so we collected leaf tissues from throughout the province, over 300 samples, and we examined the genetic structure of populations using uh, GBS or genotype by sequencing. And what we're looking at is probably a fairly normalized haplotype distribution in the south and into the slope of the Rockies. But in the north, there's a tremendous amount of diversity. Not only are all haplogroups in the province represented here, there are two additional and unique populations that grow exclusively at archaeological village sites, including that population in green, which is Tamlahamid. This is the origin city and place of all Timshan, Nishka, and Giksan people. And it's important to note the hazelnut up here, it's not like it's a few you know, scattered populations. It is, in some cases, the dominant understory of the forest. And so this is, for us, unequivocal evidence that hazelnut was managed to some extent by people, naturalizing over time, calling into question what is wild, understanding how we can study diversity, certainly at this uh, scale, and you know, to what extent people are acknowledged in this process. Hazelnut is a wild species, and in, in British Columbia, there's no idea of it being managed. There's a very small pocket of us that are just toying with this idea now, the connection of hazelnut to large archaeological village complexes is also worth noting. The connection between plant assemblies and where people live for a very long time is another compelling tool for historical ecologists. Again, this isn't new. There's been a lot of work on this uh, in Central America, South America, and here in Europe. But following the hazelnut trail, it became pretty clear pretty quickly uh, that this was part of a larger modified landscape. And this led to the reemergence of Spachgangan, which is a Gixan word meaning a place where you garden in the forest. We now call these forest gardens. Uh, loosely defined as semi open broadleaf forests, um, lots of small fruit and nut trees, fruit shrubs, edible herbaceous root foods, so things like Malus fusca, Shepherdia canadensis tons of vaccinium, prunus, rubus, viburnums, uh, fritillaria, camchensis, many, many more. And the assembly of species, of course, varies site to site between the north and the south and the composition of species closer to the coast versus those further inland. Uh, but we know they grow exclusively at old home sites. We've now identified 14 forest gardens throughout the Lachyop, in Tsleil-Waututh, Shehalis, Nuchatlit, Gitgata, Gitniaw, Kitslis, Kitsum Kalem, I have to say all the names, it's respect. The majority of these sites, though, have not been inhabited or people haven't been there for at least 150 to 200 years, largely because of colonial displacement policies, and so these places have not been managed or maintained in a really long time. Despite this, and despite the fact that these, the species growing in the forest gardens are wild and, and plentiful throughout British Columbia, as environmental scientists and um, bureaucrats are always want to tell me, but it's this specific assembly of all these species, all these ethnobotanically important species in one spot. That's what really what we're flagging here. And so with all the sites, one of the things we did is every forest garden kind of has this looming large conifer forest that's moving in on it. This is kind of the, your typical temperate rainforest, what you think of when you think of the Pacific Northwest, right? Lots of cedar, lots of spruce, pine. Um, and, and the conifer forest is kind of coming in on the forest garden. And so we looked at comparing these two types of forests, again, with those paired 14 sites. And so we did some soil analyses and um, uh, botanical inventories between the forest gardens and periphery sites and indicator species uh, analysis showed, you know, what are the indicator species for forest gardens? All delicious foods. What are the um, forest garden indic or periphery forest uh, indicator species? Again, these uh, typical kind of conifer trees, uh, conifer dominant trees in the Pacific Northwest, but it's important to note that the conifer forests aren't, you know, acultural or a human. These are incredibly well-spaced trees. There's not a lot of big stumps like you would see in a cup block or something. So people were probably intermittently managing the periphery forest as well, probably through fire and all my shovel tests. There's always 
you know, charcoal lenses and micro charcoal everywhere. But if you look at the ethnobotanical significance too, it's important to flag, you can eat almost any plant in the Pacific Northwest for at least a small window in the year if you really, really want to. But whether or not a plant can be harvested in large quantities and then stored over the long term, that really indicates its level of salience. And so these are all kind of the top storable, delicious foods that people would be harvesting. Um, and of course, that's why when you think of plants that grow near the home and ones that you're tending over the long term to store over the long term, that's the very definition of a garden and why we started calling these forest gardens also, for those of you that know, uh, it is a borrowed term for similar agroforestry practices that have been identified in Central America as well. Okay, so we knew forest gardens were a lot more rich based on our inventories, a lot more rich. And so we wanted to look at its functions as well. One of the ways that we did this was look at a series of plant traits in those, both those ecosystems in the forest gardens and in the ambient conifer forests. Um, and what we found, just as a taste, there's a bunch of traits, but I'll just share a few with you. Uh, seed mass was really interesting. So seed mass was a lot higher in forest gardens, and that makes sense to some extent. Larger seed is larger fruit. That's the economically important for, part for people. But also larger seeds are harder to self-pollinate altogether in one spot like this. And so it may require an extra hand, literally a human hand, to propagate. And what we know from ethnographies among Gixan, Simshan, and Nishka is that the main kind of method of transplanting, at least locally, was to move things vegetatively. Right away, this tells us that these species aren't likely to assemble without some kind of commensal relationship with humans. I've collapsed these two traits because they're quite similar. Um, and they essentially have the same value. All this is saying is that forest gardens have a higher frequency of animal dispersed and animal pollinated species. So this means that forest gardens are the result of animal movement. And of course, humans are included in that category. But on top of that, this suggests that after people departed from the villages or were forcibly removed 150, 200 years ago, forest gardens began providing really unique uh, an important habitat for animals and pollinators. These are huge biodiverse breaks in otherwise very continuous conifer forests. Um, at all the sites we work at, moose, bear, and deer, elk are all very common, and the elders know this. When we're working with elders, it's like, they always say, oh, you're going to, to that place where it's really good to hunt. You know, there's this kind of just understanding that that is a place where animals are now. And so not only are forest gardens providing you know, these important services in the past, they're also continuing to provide functions and services in the present. And I'll just kind of give you a snapshot of one of these places where we're doing intensive research at the landscape scale. This is, again, very historical ecology. The scale is the landscape. And so this is um, Gixeh. Again, this is in this northwestern part of British Columbia, just south of the Alaska Panhandle. Uh, and Gixeyik is a large archaeological village complex in an even larger archaeological uh, landscape spanning about 6,000 years of occupation. And it's a very rich cultural landscape. The community, the same titles and chiefly names have been carried out in the Adao, in the oral histories from 6,000 years ago to present. So it's you know, arguably a very long and consistent occupation. The reserve where people were reloaded quite relocated to in the canyon is just outside of here. So really the same lineages have been in this 20 square kilometer area for over 6,000 years. And you can see this is kind of a, um, a profile of the forest garden. So in this area here is the, uh, what we call the village core. There's 17 ha house platforms and we've just excavated the first kind of smidgen of them. Um, and behind the village is where we have the forest garden, and then behind that is the conifer forest. Uh, with Kitsilas and uh, one of the youth programs last summer, we did a field school where we ran a bunch of high level uh, soil analyses, lidar and drone mapping, and my specialty, paleoethnobotany. And we did some dendrochronology work, which we did to ascertain whether or not the conifers were encroaching. And in fact, the crab apples, 
which are kind of the biggest one we could core, right? A lot of these species don't live past 60, although the root crown we tried to core did not work out. Um, but the crab apples were significantly older than the conifer trees on the periphery, confirming what we thought, that the conifer trees are encroaching on these ecosystems, but at the same time that encroach encroachment is happening very, very slowly. You know, this part of the Pacific Northwest is in like very, very productive region. You know, you can log a forest and within 22 years, it's back to a mature stand. It's very, very productive. And so the fact that these places persist, you know, 150, 200 years since people stopped managing them is quite impressive and, and does indicate a level of resilience. And the soils, we love the soils. The soils are incredibly interesting. If you're looking for human modified ecosystems, look underground. Um, again, thinking about that kind of breakdown of the village core, that was characterized by your typical kind of shellless midden, so two meters of uh, anthropogenic types of soil. You can see Sierra there, lots of fire cracked rock, lithics, fill, that kind of thing. On the other end, in the conifer forest, what we see are um, these just different types of podzols, so very acidic uh, types of soils, very, very small organic horizons in the middle, in the forest gardens. It was different from both. There wasn't that same kind of mid and fill. There was more of a natural soil formation process, but there was literally, you know, 40 to 50 centimeters of just black earth excavating some of the pieces or some of the, um, some of the bulk samples we found. Well, very uh, isolated uh, salmon vertebra. This is really far from the river, so there's an expectation that people were maybe fertilizing, right, with uh, salmon. And um, the paleoethnobotanical data was really interesting. I won't get into this too much, but um, basically, no fossilized plants were located in the forest gardens, but in the village, within just like a liter of soil, that was floated and all the charred materials rise to the top, and then we identify those materials, and just in a single liter, there were 19 plant taxa, all of which represented with forest garden species. So I'm just running through some of the methods we're doing, and hopefully it kind of um, it has a bit of interest for you guys. But beyond the methods, you know, every single one of the communities that we've worked with, every single one of them, the, the historical ecology, the archeology, span it's really fascinating. But in the end, it's always the same question, time and again. How do we bring them back? How do we bring them back? How do we start managing these places again? And you know, a lot of the management strategies and objectives are derived directly from the elders. I mean, they know how to breathe life back into these places. But the archaeology and the soil analyses, these have all been instrumental, too, in some ways in the process. So we've set up experimental plots, testing different management strategies. Uh, and we're also looking at recreating that soil matrix that we find in the village, or sorry, in the forest garden site. We've taken hundreds and hundreds of cuttings from the forest garden to see which ones root and propagate. It's just an ongoing fly by the seat of your pants, like how do we get these places breathing again? And as I alluded to in the beginning of the talk, these accounts of land use, of forest gardening and management, completely reject coloniality and colonial assertions that persist in our classrooms and in our courts. Loggers in BC, for example, are not want to accept the forests were managed by people. In our courts, this is the same. I was called to the stand as an expert witness in the New Chatlet Rights and Title case, which is currently being held in the Supreme Court. And forest gardens were uh, provided as one of the lines of evidence brought forward by the New Chatlet Nation because the Crown, the Canadian government, was using these very racist and outdated ideas about people and land use. They were claiming that the New Chatlet were just dispersed hunter-gatherers, that they didn't use the land, and so they had no title to it. Our research, of course, showed the exact opposite. And to quote Chief Jordan Michael here, he says, quote, <clears throat> these forest gardens demonstrate how our laws were activated through our people and through the living knowledge of the land and water. Our forest gardens were not tended by the British. They were stewarded by my people long before the queen knew, knew the taste of a crab apple. As we kind of explore this idea of sources in historical ecology over the next few days, you know, 
And a lot of the literature, historical ecology is always um, conceived of as this very applied discipline, right? And I think that's very important. But beyond application, there's still a lot of framing and reframing and decolonizing that needs to be done, at least in settler nations with this research. In Gixan context, forest gardens are firmly situated in Guilliens. This is a mindset described by Don Ryan Hanamuch here as a 360 view of the land, looking forwards, looking backwards, but also encompassing the responsibility to ensure that waters, forests, and lands are protected for grandchildren and their children. And really importantly, this is not um, you know, just an ideology or for us a scientific experiment. This is part of their legal obligation to the WILP, to the land, their house group, which is the social unit and the foundation of their ecological, economic, and cultural systems. If you guys are familiar with Fikret Berkey's, you know, he's done a lot of work on this where, you know, there's traditional knowledge and then there's, you know, management practices and those are kind of nested. Surrounding all of those things are the social structures and the governance structures, right? We have all the tools and technology to, you know, repair the land, but we're, we're not doing it because of things like social structures, ideologies, and governance. So Guilliens, for example, is not captured in our grant writing, it's not captured in the courts, and it's certainly not captured in concepts of biodiversity or functional diversity. Hanamuk, Gwinnanet, Maluluk, all the hereditary leaders we work with assert that if we continue to present the land in terms of resources, or polygons or fee simple lands, if we continue to translate things in this way, we're in trouble. The data and the scientific research are extremely important and no one is saying that we reject that completely. But it is by, by its very nature, it tends to erase the core values of the spiritual view of the land of Guilliens, which allow these places to function. That people worked very hard to make peace with the salmon that people worked very hard to make peace with the wetlands. And so as historical ecologists, how do we make peace with some of our own colonial superstructures that pers persist as we begin to start gathering more and more data and mobilizing our data? There's a bit of a cognitive dissonance between, or, or because you know something like this is, is close to, and we're getting closer to, but not entirely engaged with the realities that we're trying to support and uplift on the ground. And I'm cynical at times because the Canadian state still refuses to acknowledge or recognize Gixan, Wet'suwet'en, and Simshan sovereignty and title, despite all evidence pointing to their ownership resulting in more economically, socially, and ecologically rich outcomes. By the way, it doesn't mean people didn't make mistakes. The Adao are fundamentally built on this idea that great disasters are the mark of a society that's wise, that people learn from their mistakes, they culturally code them. And that is part of Gwilliens, which we don't capture. Um, but I think, you know, as we kind of move towards this decolonial turn a little more, um, I do wonder how we can capture that in a way that's not appropriative, but also respectful. And on that, cheerful question and point. I will end. Thank you so much. Oh, and please, a very, very big thank you to Leticia and Miguel so much for organizing this and inviting me, and this is just wonderful. Thank you so much. Chelsea, that was really inspiring and fascinating. Um, I think well, there's echo. We can call Peter if you don't mind coming back to the to the stage. We can start a round of discussion. <laughs> um, hi, I already see a couple of questions. So, okay, we can share the room. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start with Graciela, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Thank, thank you so much to both of you. Uh, it, it was really fascinating. I'm a natural scientist, so anything related to history is super inspiring to me. And I have questions for both of you. I will start with Chelsea. Um, I, I really found fascinating your talk. Um, partially because I've also worked in Africa with indigenous people, and I've always found the way they treat the landscape uh, interesting and the way the state treats the people quite hurting. At the same time, I cannot deny that it's difficult to me to, um, to, to come to terms in how we understand wilderness. So when you say we compare two forests and we compare the functional traits in those two forests, one was like uh, the northwestern temperate forest and then the other one was the peripheral, kind of thing. So let's assume that, like, as you evidenced, you have your forest gardens that were assembled by human management for a long time. And then you were comparing them with a, a conifer forest. So my question here is, wouldn't you find logical that seed mass or dispersal traits are essentially different and not necessarily good, you know, in terms of what is good and what is bad, just simply these are different for us. So that, that'll be my question for you. Yeah, and this is a wonderful question and something I think, you know, we should definitely explore throughout the few weeks here. Like, what is a control? If you are looking at a landscape that's been altered by people and you're not sure which have been and haven't, I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect control, right? So the reason why we chose those two to compare was that all 14 sites had the same phenomena of the conifer forest, and it was less about highlighting the differences than just pointing out what is one doing. What is the forest, can you hear me okay? What is the forest garden doing? What are some of the things that it's doing, right? The conifer forest isn't part of like an experimental sample, and it's not really a control either, but there's n there was no other thing to kind of compare it with. It was just the most, um, you know, it was the same, the, the conifer forest had the same aspect, the same elevation, the same, you know, it's just two different things going on. And, rem and still, it wasn't a wild conifer forest. There's still evidence of management. There's still evidence of fire. There's culturally modified trees in every single one of them. Yeah, but then you have totally different species. So you cannot compare an apple tree with a pine tree, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. In, yeah, I guess I should say it's not pointing out... Um, like, like the biodiversity indices, we knew that just by standing in these places, you know one's going to be more biologically diverse than the other, but knowing by to which gradient and how much, the functional traits were a similar type of test where you're just pointing out a trend rather than saying better, worse, this is something completely different. And it plays out on the ground, like the fact that, okay, these are, you know, great spaces for animals. Well, that's what the elders are saying too. It's kind of just another way to present the data as a narrative, not so much as proving something versus the other. Okay. It's, a, it's a narrative scope, but yeah. 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 And then my question for Peter was about that. Uh, I think it was an in preparation kind of work from the Long Boot database. And you were presenting Avius Alba results. And I was wondering whether you've been able to compare these with uh, results from natural archives, not uh, historical archives, like uh, cores from pit box of lakes? Yeah, of course we do that as well, yes, quite often, yes. This was just the historical data for this day. This, for ABS it would be, I mean, the, the, the disappearance is so recent that there's no point in, you know, comparing this to, I don't know, palynology. We know what happened, we just don't know why it happened. For other species, sure, yes, we do that as well. And of course, as a, yeah, I talked a lot about archival sources, but they never tell the whole story, of course. You need all the rest, of course. Yeah. Well, thanks to both of you. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for both talks. They were fascinating, and uh, I greatly enjoyed, in particular, the talk about Canada. I recently read Over's story, so it was very, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, it was connecting a lot to the emotions that I had over this very long read. Um, I wanted to bring in an Eastern European perspective into what you've been, uh, what Chelsea has been, you have been presenting on 
um, the indigenous people. So we also had, after 1945, a lot of displacement in this part of the world. And there is a lot of like ecological legacy, I would say, that bears many similarities, but it hasn't been, perhaps Peter, correct me, it hasn't been studied so much. I mean, it's something people talk about, something people can see, experience. Um, just to give two examples, one example is from the southeast corner of Poland and the um, um, displacement of the Ruthenian population, so Ukrainian, let's say, uh, population from this area, both to Ukraine and to other parts of Poland. So we have these very, um, very richly populated villages in the Carpathians that today do not exist anymore. You wouldn't see any buildings, but these are actually ecological hotspots of biodiversity. And these relatively uniform forests of the conifer forests of the Carpathians, because all the ore cards and everything, it was, you know, just left within a day. People were just forced in 1947, 48 to like leave within a week and so on. And it, the plants just stayed and they are still there replanting. You can see different degree of rewilding. And it's something that exists in, let's say, the ecological activist discourse in Poland. But I think there is relatively recent research, uh, relatively little research because it's so recent, yes? Mm -hmm. Another aspect would be in uh, Western Poland where the German population was displaced and we never had enough population to, I mean, we as country, to resettle. So there is a lot of villages that were never resettled and they, were, they are surrounded by industrial forests very often, like pine monoculture, but still the village sites would be exactly these witnesses to the biodiversity that the previous population uh, maintained for hundreds of years, usually from the 14th century or something like that, when this area was colonized in the medieval times. So it's very, it was really interesting to me to listen to your presentation because it, it bears so many similarities with what I observe in different parts of, uh, of my part of the continent. So I just wanted to bring in this perspective. Thank you again. Interesting. Yeah, because there's, there's some research on this, of course, but uh, framing the uh, dislocation of the Germans from Poland, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic as some sort of, a, you know, in, in, an, in an indigenous, that would be extremely mm. problematic. This is a highly, highly nationalized, sort of uh, very, 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 very thorny issue. Mm. Of course, no one would like to talk about it this way. Mm. Uh, I totally agree. It's, very, it's a very difficult political question, of course. And yes, I didn't think that, of course, there is the, like, all the borderlands of Czechia um, that probably, I imagine, have the same, like, ecological story. But what is fascinating, at least from the perspective of someone who now kind of lives in these Western areas, is to see how there is, like in many ways, a similar process of rupture, yes? That there has been some traditional landscape maintained for centuries, and it was just left standing, yes? And nothing was happening. And on many levels it's fascinating, because you also have the hydrological level. There was a huge milling landscape. First, the Red Army destroyed it. Then, after 50 years, there was some maintenance for the communist time uh, by the state-run farms. Then it collapsed after the fall of communism. And for the last 30 years, you had complete rewilding even of the stream, of the local rivers, and everything. Um, so. I, I would imagine that many, like, even if we avoid, like, and probably nobody would exploit, like, the indigenous, I was not even thinking about this aspect of this problem, but there would be interesting comparative aspects in terms of the social ecological processes, I imagine. Yeah, and the, the rewilding thing is very contentious <laughs> in a lot of places, and I think one of the, you know, you can look at something like clam gardens, right? These are kind of intertidal managed coastlines that run from Alaska all the way to Northern California. And they have shown just indices of like higher diversity of bivalves and all sorts of other uh, intertidal species. But even though they are, you know, quote, more diverse, 
they require human maintenance, that there is a plateau point where it is going to, um, it, is, it, it isn't going to have those same high rates of diversity and food access and all those things. So people are, uh, like you were just alluding to at the very end there, that there's you know, a system in place that has both social and ecological roles. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I just uh, wanted to jump the queue a little bit to, to tell an example of displacement here also in Spain that is historically documented in when they, this was uh, most, mostly Maria for lots of centuries and there was this uh, wars to, uh, for, for centuries about uh, what is called reconquery or whatever, I don't know the, exactly the name, but this part of Andalusia was uh, made Christian about the mid 13th century and the kingdom of Granada was left, was, wasn't, was conquered in the late uh, 15th century, but the population uh, remained there, so, so they were officially converted until they made a civil war in the end of the 16th century and they were all deported. It was a huge uh, a genocide. Uh, but the, the, apart from the horrible part, the interesting part is the, that they kept the lands of all the properties were uh, uh, inventoried and were given to people coming from Castille, uh, from the northern places, and where all properties are described in an archive in Granada, so they have thousands of, of individual properties with all the crops that were there and so on. So, so uh, and it really made a huge change, and it is a very large area, and, and that I have never been to that document, but they exist, so it's a, a it's very nice thing of <laughs> displacement, this horrible stuff of displacement, but it's uh, such a great opportunity for knowing. So. Yeah. Thank you very much both to Peter and Chelsea for such a cool and inspiring talks. Um, I was going to ask a question about dating of your sites, Chelsea, but I <laughs> now I also need a little bit more of more Eastern European perspective. I just found it, I'm Ukrainian, I just uh, found it so fascinating how the aquaculture-based societies are getting off-handed dismissed by the colonizers uh, because now we know that um, Ukrainians in the south of Ukraine and some other Eastern steppe people like Kipchaks and Brodniks were really dependent on the fisheries and managed proto-aquaculture in the lower uh, parts of Dnieper and Dniester and Pivden Nebuch, and then the Russian Empire raided in there, says, ah, no aquaculture, ah. No, no agriculture, and it's so backwards. Ah. Now we will bring the civilization here. And then, trying to bring an agriculture into the very area, the um, hydrological regime was screwed up, and by the 1950s, people needed to increase the productivity of the estuariums by introducing Caspian invertebrates because fisheries crashed. But it was working just fine before it was offhandedly dismissed. Uh, sorry. No, that's fascinating. Uh, but what I wanted to ask is, um, how do you date uh, the forest gardens? Do you use dendrochronology, carbon isotopes, paleolimnology, and are there any evidence of like pre-Clovis human management of the forests anywhere in North America? I'm sorry, that is a very naive question. No, no, that's fine. That's a great question. I might even defer to you on that one. Okay. Um, just for the first one, dating is really interesting. And, you know, archaeologists, we are, um, you know, compulsively obsessed with dates. Temporal control is very important, right? So dating an ecosystem, a live one, is a challenge for archaeologists because we're usually dating things below the ground. One of the kind of practices that we found, and I, I didn't get to talk about it, but using the paleoethnobotanical data as proxies for you know what could have been growing there. So for example, in the village core where the house depressions are, there's a series of caches. These are cultural depressions where people would have been storing and processing food and very stratigraphically rich. So, you know, 40, 50 different kind of events or strata, which can be directly dated using radiocarbon isotopes, which is the primary way of dating these, and looking at what's showing up in there. If it's one hazelnut, okay, maybe not. But if it's, you know, hazelnut, crabapple, the vaccinium's, like all those forest garden species showing up in the same spot and dating that, we can probably say with relative ease that, that there's some relation there. 
Um, but otherwise, the dendrochronology, like I said, it's very hard. The, the longest living species in forest gardens are apples, which live you know, maybe up to 120 years, and that's if the center hasn't been completely rotted out, versus conifer trees, which you know have much longer lifespan. So the dendro work hasn't been great. The other thing we're doing is some phytolith work. Uh, phytoliths tend to preserve really well when you have a nice open environment like forest gardens have a nicer open canopy uh, and a lot of more forbs and grasses and so that's another one that we're currently looking at. The oldest one that we've been able to date with that proxy method of the paleoethnobotanical data was 600 years ago. So not very long in historical context but still uh, you know pre-colonial and definitely contradicting colonial narratives. Yeah. Thanks, that's a great question. Pre-Clovis management, I mean, that's a huge debate with uh, mammals, but. Yes, we should both. No, you can. No, no, no. <laughs> you can. <laughs> I'm not the legal guy. <laughs> Do it. No. Hi, uh, thank you very much, uh, both of you, for, for a fascinating talk. Um, I have another question for Chelsea. Uh, sorry, Peter. Don't <laughs> um, Kind of a specific question, actually. Um, I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to the magnitude of the difference in plant biodiversity between the, the forest gardens and the surrounding landscapes. Um, and to any, to the, I'm interested in also the sort of temporal axis. So insofar as possible, you, you spoke about it a little bit just, just now, but uh, what, does, what does that difference look like through time insofar as you're able to speculate on the difference? And uh, I'm also just curious about the use of pollen records in general in the area. Thank you. Great. Uh, so biological diversity was basic. We, we just stuck to tree, shrub, and herbaceous layers. So mosses were not included in that. Uh, grasses were. And it was very, very, very different. The, the forest gardens were much, much, much more rich. Tree diversity, if you're just looking at, you know, a tree species, single woody stem over five meters, was higher in the conifer forests, right? But shrub and herbaceous layers, and you know what we're saying is the kind of mid-shrub layer, a uh, lot more rich. So, again, that back to that idea of like one's not better or worse, and in fact, it's probably their their nice transect between both that is the most productive area. Um, what was your second question? Dating, temporal range. I mean, it's interesting. I've been working with Natasha Lyons, and we're doing a huge metadata analysis of all the paleoethnobotanical work that's ever been done in British Columbia. So, you know, thousands and thousands of data sets. Like, what are the plant species showing up? Um, there is a preservation bias for, you know, a lot of the root foods and carb food. Those aren't showing up archaeologically. All we get is what's charred. If you're really lucky, you might get some water logging and really nice preservation there, but all we get is charred remains that are, you know, dropped by a hearth and mist. And so there's all sorts of gaps in that data, but again, when you're working with really, really large data sets, you can sort of start to infer certain things. What we know is that a lot of those indicator species, like take the big ones, like Pacific crabapple, hazelnut, Saskatoon, Amelanchier, Alnofolia, uh, and Shepherdia canadensis are showing up consistently over thousands and thousands of years throughout the province with a couple blips on the coast where there was maybe a shift in, in demographic, but otherwise pretty consistent use as far as the management goes. The further we go back in time, the less and less we know. <laughs> Third question. Pollen. Pollen. Yeah, so we've done, <laughs> we're kind of in the like, midst of figuring these places out, I should say, we only started thinking of these Spachgangan like five years ago, right? This is very, very recent, but the phytolith and pollen trip was a big one that I was really hoping to get at because this kind of environmental reconstruction versus just these proxies at ARC village sites was something we wanted to do. So one site has a really nice big old pond right behind it, and so this summer, now we just need someone to analyze it. If you know anyone that's very um, good at IDing pollen records in the Pacific Northwest, there's like one guy and he's retired, so. If you know. <laughs> Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I have a question for Peter, and I am a neoecologist, and I wonder if you have any advice for people like me who are interested in using archival data 
how can we avoid making silly mistakes when we're trying to pull a current data from the archives? Um, there have been, in recent times, a few rents published as scientific papers. Um, and they always said, and I agree with this, is get a historian or get a social scientist into your team, and that's how you do it, I think. I mean, you can do it otherwise, you know, but you'll, you'll make your life more difficult because you have to acquire the skills to do this, and you run the risk of misinterpretation. Or, you know, it's just get someone who knows this stuff. Of course, the trouble is that you need to get someone who's interested in this. And there aren't so many of them, you know, it's just like the pollen guy, you know, it's like <laughs> there's the one and he's gonna, be, she's gonna be busy, yeah? Yeah, but that's, that's the, if, if you're really at the beginning, that's the best advice I have. Get someone who's, a, get, get a historian, a social scientist, or someone who's doing what you're interested in. Thank you. So I just wanted to add a comment, if I may, to Peter's answer. So you even need to get a, his like, a specialist historian. Like we are a team of historians and geologists and biologists, and I am a historian myself. But since we are working on like old Turkish documents from Greece, we need exactly the person who does that because there is like such an amount of detail that needs to be understood that bursts on the interpretation that like, it, it comes with, effort. so it's not that any historian can do anything. On the other hand, I can say that the historian that is doing that for us had nothing, like, was not an environmental historian at all before, but I think we managed to convert him. Um, and he's, he has a lot of neophyte and enthusiasm in a way. So in this sense, I would add a positive note. You can also get in touch with historians who haven't done something like that, but who have the skills that are really rare very often, like the kind of documents he reads, perhaps 10 people can read, yes, at the moment. Uh, but it's enough. You can find one who would work with you, I think. So it's not... Um, it's not impossible to get people on board, especially in, in the face of the current planetary crisis. I think they want to, they like being involved and becoming relevant. Maybe I'll just add to that too. Even with, you know, I found um, in that court case, the Canadian government had their own uh, team of archaeologists and anthropologists reviewing historical documents and they would say to Chief Michael on the stand when he talked about forest gardening, they'd say, well, no, look here, Sprout said you didn't have agriculture. Like very, very, like the just base baseline kind of reading of the historical materials without kind of any context or scholarly, just even tinkering. It was very, very, um, yeah, and, and these are archeologists as well. And so, you know, beyond even just the disciplinary focus, I think having kind of an ally, someone that wants to do the work and effectively will, will dig deep is important. More questions, more comments? So maybe, may just Thank you very much. Well, it has been so nice. <laughs> yes. uh, maybe I'll applaud for, <laughs> for yeah. that. Yeah. And two quick things. First, uh, for formality issues, w uh, there is a signature sheet around, and we are not very formal people, so we lost it. So That's somewhere true. there is. <laughs> There is, yes, okay, yeah. <laughs> there it is. So uh, try to be sure that you sign uh, your, your days here. It really doesn't matter if you are going to stay some days because you're saying the other, but, but we, we have to keep track of the people, so, so do sign in the, on, the, on the leaves. And then uh, we have a, a dinner, a small dinner here right now, so it is right at outside, and it's uh, nice weather. We're going to be nice here outside, so... So uh, we just meet tomorrow, we open at nine, start at n half past nine, so we continue tomorrow with the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.